Hello everyone and welcome back to Be Here Now. Now today we're looking at the lost history of Manchester United Football Club. Perhaps the biggest club in the world, certainly up there with the likes of Real Madrid and Barcelona. Today they've got more fans globally than any other team in the world. And they're a multinational corporation with as many investors as fans. And they reside here at Old Trafford, uh, humbly named after the place where it was built, the third largest stadium in the UK with a capacity of over 75,000. Now they've been here since 1910, eight years after becoming Manchester United, and 32 years after forming under a different name, Newton Heath, Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Company. Now it's those early years I want to look at with you now. Uh, where was the cradle of this footballing giant, and is there anything left for us to see? stood in the middle of a roundabout filming what looks like a couple of office buildings. Well, I think a lot of people around here are thinking the same. But well, this is it. This is the very first ground of uh, Manchester United or Newton Heath LYR as they were then known. So Newton Heath is a suburb of East Manchester. It's a couple of miles from the city centre on the road to Oldham and in the late 19th century this was a very industrialised area with row upon row of red brick terraced houses, cotton mills, foundries and above all one of the biggest railway works in the region. In 1878, workers at the carriage and wagon department of the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Depot in Newton Heath decided to form a football team. Initially, they only played against other departments and railway companies, but on the 20th of November 1880, they played in their first recorded match against Bolton Wanderers Reserves, losing 6-0. So roughly where I'm sat now is where the ground would have been. I'm on Northampton Road in Newton Heath. Um, it used to be North Road. I'll just show you the other side of the road. Um, because over there would have been back in the day iron foundries and railway sidings and carriage sheds. Now it was said that the pitch was a bumpy stony patch in summer and a muddy heavy swamp in the winter months. With all the trains passing around here the pitch was often clouded in a thick mist of steam. So imagine that trying to play a game of football on the worst kind of surface imaginable um, not being able to see what you're doing half the time. In fact, there were no facilities at all in those early years, with players forced to change into their kits at a public house a few hundred metres away called the Three Crowns, a place that unfortunately closed down and was demolished in later years. This side-by-side -side map allows us to compare the present day, on the right-hand side of the screen, with a map from the 1880s. Here we have Newton Heath, and zooming in shows us this collection of very large buildings, belonging to the carriage and wagon works of the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Company. So you can see here North Road and Mostenbrook running down the back. The smattering of small buildings where my cursor is was Monsol Hospital, a place for those with infectious diseases. But it's this strange diamond, unmarked and unlabeled, where the team played their very first matches and where eventually they would draw crowds of between 12 and 15,000 people on a weekly basis. A look at a later map from the 1890s shows that this same patch of land was quickly swallowed up by the hospital expansion. But it's useful to look at this in more detail to assess how huge and extensive the carriage and wagon works was at the site. The site covered a vast area full of sidings and engine sheds. And just to indicate a sense of scale, we've got some terraced houses up here, some of which are still there today. So where is all this in the 21st century? Well, if you look at the right hand side of the screen, you can see a modern day map. The round green building here is a distinctive Central Park tram stop running, of course, along a former railway line. These two large buildings are the headquarters of Greater Manchester Police, and over here is a college building. But most of the former pitch space is taken up by these office buildings, currently hosting the Fujitsu Company. 
by the mid 1880s the team had been fairly successful on a local level winning four manchester and district challenge cups they also signed their first star players in jack powell jack and roger doughty and tom burke uh, in an effort to become more professional now newton heath were at first snubbed by the creators of the football league in 1888 and instead played in a minor league known as the combination and then the less prestigious football alliance the Alliance became a rival to the Football League, but by the 1892-93 season, the Alliance and the League merged and the new Football League consisted of two competitions, the 1st Division and the 2nd Division. Newton Heath were invited to join the 1st Division, but a torrid opening season saw them finish bottom, only avoiding relegation by beating champions of the 2nd Division, Small Heath, in a playoff. So the end of the North Road era had been coming for some time, and all this was owned by Manchester Cathedral and leased by the railway company across the road. But the club knew that they had to increase capacity if they wanted any hope of joining the Football League. They wanted to build two grandstands that would bump uh, capacity up to about 15,000. Um, unfortunately, the railway company weren't willing to pick up the tab for that. And in fact, stopped paying rent altogether. And then the cathedral increased the rent anyway. Uh, they didn't like the idea of charging people for entering the ground, but that was Newton Heath's only source of income. Inevitably, the club had to say goodbye to North Road. In the summer of 1893, Newton Heath came here to Bank Street in Clayton. Only two kilometres away, uh, but a little bit close to the city centre. Now the ground they used was an athletic track owned by a local athletic company. Okay, so the ground is this behind me, but if I turn around, this up here would have been a large chemical works. Um, and it was a bit of a running joke that if Newton Heath were playing badly, then the chemical works would belch out a cloud of acrid fumes that would affect the visiting team. Now the condition of the pitch here was worse than North Road, if anything. Uh, during the 1894 to 95 season, visiting Walsall uh, even complained to the referee about the state of the pitch. Uh, when they were finally persuaded to play the game, they ended up losing 14 nil. Now that would have been a record for Newton Heath um, that would have still stood today for Manchester United if the Football League hadn't decided to scrap the game and scrap the score and force the teams to have a replay. Um, Warsaw played a little bit better in the second game actually, losing only 9 nil. But by now, Newton Heath had been relegated to the second division, having finished bottom for the second season in the Football League. For the next few years, things were looking really grim. The map from the 1890s shows us the site around Bank Street and the very large area covered by the chemical works. Also nearby is the Ashton Canal, a handful of mills and an electricity generating station. Now in the middle of all this was a very large patch of wasteland. And this is the site the athletic club used and where Newton Heath eventually moved to. Now on the right hand side of the screen you can see that the ground is now occupied by this large shiny building which is the indoor BMX track for the British BMXing team, attached of course to the velodrome. Today the Chemical Works is now a superstore and a police depot with the only remaining buildings from that era being these terraced houses. In 1898 former club president W Crompton bought the site and allowed them to remove the running track. However, the cost of building new stands, coupled with increasing player wages, sent the club into financial turmoil. In 1901, the club managed just 10th place in the second division, and financial troubles were mounting fast. In desperation, the club decided to hold a four-day fundraiser at St James's Hall in the city centre. One of the attractions of the fundraiser was a St Bernard dog called Major, owned by team captain Harry Stafford. Major's job was to carry a collection tin, but on the last day, he wandered away, along with his tin and all the money it contained. Eventually, he was found by a local brewer called John Henry Davis. Now, it was said that Davis's daughter was so smitten with Major that Davis inquired about the tin, found the team captain and offered to buy the dog from him. Stafford said no, but by now Davis had already become interested in what was going on. Eventually, he donated a large amount of money to the club and Stafford was so grateful that he let Davis keep the dog. A year later, club president William Healy issued a winding up order, which is a serious legal threat, for the £242 he was owed by the club. It was John Henry Davis and three other investors that came in at the 11th hour and saved the club from liquidation. 
Now on the 26th of April 1902, with Davis as president, the club decided they no longer had um, proper ties with Newton Heath anymore. So after considering other names like Manchester Central and Manchester Celtic, uh, the name Manchester United was officially announced. The expansion of Bank Street continued as the years went by and the club hired their first proper manager, Ernest Magnon. Within four years, all sides of the ground were enclosed by stands for the first time, raising the capacity to a staggering 50,000 and helping United win promotion to the upper division. Now, when local rivals Manchester City were hit by a corruption scandal and forced to sell many of their players, Magnon persuaded some of the best to come across town and play for the Reds, including Welsh winger Billy Meredith arguably the greatest footballer of the era. In 1908, Manchester United won their first ever First Division title, and a year later they won their first FA Cup, beating Bristol City 1-0 in the final. United players, particularly Billy Meredith and Charlie Roberts, were instrumental in forming the first ever Players' Union. Now the game had become very professional, and as wages increased, it was important that someone began to look out for the players' best interests across the country. However, in 1910, the game's governing body, the Football Association, threatened to suspend any players that dared join a union, hoping that it could wield ultimate power over the flourishing sport. United players were the only team that stood up to the bullying, refusing to relinquish their union membership. This earned them the nickname of the Outcasts, a source of great pride. Now that's probably the start of something that continues even today, a rebelliousness, blazing their own trail. Uh, the idea that Manchester United as a club proud to be different from the rest, no matter what anyone else thinks. But by then, United had outgrown the physical limitations of Bank Street. Um, in January 1910, just 5,000 people came out to see United's last game here, which was a 5-0 win against Tottenham Hotspur. Now the timing was perfect, because only a few days later, uh, a powerful storm hit the area, and the, the roof of the Bank Street stand was blown off into the houses opposite. So today this site is used by the National Cycling Centre. Over my shoulder there is the velodrome and the big building there where United's ground used to be is the BMX track for the National BMXing team. Uh, the only thing around here to signal that United played here at all is a red plaque on one of the houses on Bank Street. Now interestingly, if I just do this a little bit, you'll see the home of Manchester City, the City of Manchester Stadium or the Etihad as they call it. Um, it's just over there. It's half a mile away from where United once was. So the final home of United was here, to the west of the city in Trafford. This map from that period shows the ground in one of its earliest forms, much smaller than it is today. Notice how much space there is around the stadium. Unlike North Road and Bank Street, this area gave the club the potential to grow and settle in for the long term. Now United would go on to have some major ups and major downs. Uh, the First World War would interrupt their initial success in the league and after that they'd be relegated to the second division and hit financial struggle once again. The Second World War put a grinding stop to football in England. In 1941, a German bomb, probably meant for the nearby port at Salford Keys, hit Old Trafford. 
completely destroying the main stand, which is the south stand today. During reconstruction work following the war, United were forced to play their home games at Main Road. The stadium arrivals Manchester City. Now I'll be looking at their history in another video, but for now let's just enjoy the thought of these two fierce rivals sharing um, a stadium in that post-war era. Now at Bank Street we saw how the histories of both clubs were rubbing shoulders, uh, but in the 1940s they actually had something tangible. They treaded the same bit of turf. The rich history of the club is honoured in the stadium today. The 1958 Munich air disaster is remembered by a memorial. Manager Matt Busby would oversee United's first real spell as a world-class team, winning five league titles in the 50s and 60s alongside two FA Cups and a 1968 European Cup, the first English side to win it. Statues of George Best, Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law, the Holy Trinity as they became known, stand proud outside the ground. Charlton himself now has a stand named after him, the South Stand. Meanwhile, Alex Ferguson, the most successful manager in English football history, is also honoured the stand and a statue. Now today Manchester United are the most successful club in British football in history, uh, adored by millions of fans worldwide and loathed by their rivals. Now they would go on to win 20 league titles, 12 FA Cups, 5 League Cups, 21 Community Shields, a European Super Cup, a European Cup Winners Cup, a Europa League, an Intercontinental Cup, three European Cups and a FIFA World Club Cup too. Now with all that in mind, it's strange to think that all this was built uh, off the back of just a few railway workers in Newton Heath who just wanted to play a bit of football. Now Manchester City fans often joke about United's grounds not being within the Manchester City limits. It's actually in Trafford. But the soul of this club is firmly Mancunian uh, with both Newton Heath and Clayton uh, falling within Manchester City limits. In fact, the area around City Stadium in Clayton today is populated more by United fans than City fans. Now on the flip side, United fans often joke about Manchester City not having as rich a history as United do. Well, if you give us a like and subscribe, in the next video I'll be looking at their history to see whether that's true or not. Uh, but for now, I'll leave you with a great view of the Bridgewater Canal and Old Trafford. See you later.